We're so glad to have you here today. Uh, this is Independence Day week. Uh, we're going to celebrate our country today. Uh, we are very uh, blessed to be in the United States of America, and I still believe God is blessing America, and we're going to celebrate His blessings on America today. So we're so glad to have you here as we celebrate together. We're going to begin our service today with our pledges to our flags. So if everyone would please stand as we say our pledges. If you would come and present the flags. Let's say first the pledge to the United States flag of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now the pledge to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one brotherhood, uniting all Christians in service and in love. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we come now thanking you for the United States of America. We thank you, Lord, for being our God. And even as we studied in our Sunday school lesson this morning, you have always had a covenant relationship with your people. And Father, through that covenant relationship today, through Jesus Christ, you still promise us, Lord, that you'll take care of us, that you will bless us, if we are faithful on our part of the covenant. Father, we would ask, Lord, that you would continue to take care of America. Lord, we apologize for all of the negative and bad things in our country today, for all the sin that is prevalent in our land. But I pray, Lord, that we as Christians will stand strong in the truth and will continue to trust you, Lord, to take care of us. So, Father, today we thank you for the United States of America and we thank you for the freedoms we have here in our land. And we know, Lord, these freedoms are given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, bless this service, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you for being with us today as we celebrate today on this 4th of July week. Uh, there, we will not be having services this Wednesday night because so many people will be on vacation as they already are. Uh, but we're so thankful for you being with us today. There are a couple of things I want to bring your attention to. One is that we have a couple with us today that are celebrating their 73rd wedding anniversary. 73 years of marriage. And I don't know how because they're only 70 years old. But anyway, <laughs> Sammy and Joanne Jackson are celebrating 73 years. And I tell you the great thing about it, I, I know personally that they love each other as much today, if not even more, than when they got married 73 years ago. And God has blessed them, and they are what a wonderful example of what a Christian marriage should be and how God should be at the center of a marriage. So Sam and Joanne, thank y'all for the example you are to uh, younger families, to younger couples. And thank you for being such faithful people in your lives to Jesus Christ. And we ask God to continue to bless you. And we look forward to celebrating 75 and 80 and all that with you too. So we look forward to that. Uh, 73 years, I just, I don't know if I'll even live to be that old. But anyway, that we are so thankful. The other thing I want to remind you of real quick, we'll be having a, a all music service uh, with you, the people doing the music during the service. Uh, that will be on Sunday, July 14th. So we look forward to an exciting time of worship together that Sunday night at six o'clock. And then we'll have an ice cream fellowship afterwards. I told you I'm gonna bring you some butter pecan ice cream, not butter pecan. Uh, you bring your favorite flavor and we'll all share them together and we'll have some toppings over there also and we'll have a great time together after the fellowship. And I'm even giving myself permission to eat ice cream that night. Uh, I've been on a diet trying, but I'll give myself permission that night. So we look forward to a great time of fellowship together on uh, July the 14th. 
Uh, if you would, uh, we're going to continue with our worship now. Zane, if you would come and continue. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairie to the ocean, White with fall, God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my. need to do some jumping jacks or something. Come here, Lane. You're super strong, right? He said, fine. <laughs> All right. So you're super strong. Let me see your muscles. Your muscles. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Cindy gave us some flag tattoos, and he already put one on. You didn't waste any time, did you? All right. So here is this. I want you to give it your best karate chop and chop it in half. You did break it. That was, that was hard, wasn't it? Those big muscles, it didn't make it hard for you, right? So what I'm going to do now, try not to make a mess. Come here. I'm not done with you. Turn face, everybody. All right, so. You see how long this roll is, right? No, I'm just kidding. 
All right, so that was super easy for you to break a minute ago, right? How easy was it? Not really easy? It looked easy? You still got strong muscles, right? Huh? You still got strong muscles? Yes? Uh, uh, all right. I need you to break out of that. <laughs> well. <laughs> So, what we were going to do, <laughs> you can have a seat. So, what is freedom? You're able to do stuff, right? What is the opposite of freedom? Not being able to do something. So, the Bible kind of talks about it where it ta- when in John it tells us, that um, we're talking about being free from sin, that the opposite of that is being a slave to sin. So that means like you're, um, everything is kind of given to you. You don't really have a choice or a say in what happens. But if you are free, you get to choose. So what are some of the freedoms that we have? Reading your Bible, okay. Having a Bible. Do you know that there's places in the world right now where if they have a Bible, they're hiding it because people in, within their government or leadership or other people kill people or attack people that have Bibles even. Think of, I can think of how many Bibles I have at my house right now. And the fact that I get to have that is a huge freedom that I may overlook. What's another freedom that we have? Going to church. <laughs> yes, going to church. Being here right now. Is anybody in here scared about com- somebody coming in and in getting us if we're here at church, if we say the word God? No. We get to learn about God, and all of you learn about God at your schools, and you read the Bible, and you study God's word, and those are all freedoms that we have because of the country that we live in. So what Lane was not supposed to do was to break through that. (laughs) One little bit, it's easy for us to look at something and say, especially sin in our life, and we could say, that's not that big of a deal. I can handle that. And sometimes we take in our minds and we rationalize, I know that's wrong, but is it really? Maybe you have somebody in your life, a friend, that maybe it doesn't make the right choices, and they even tell you, it's not that bad. And we think that maybe if this person's being mean to us, I can be mean back to them because they were mean to me. And we rationalize it. I mean, we, we make it okay in our mind. And even though it's a little thing, we think we can take care of it, and we can stop it really easily. But when you, it wraps you up, it, you're not free anymore. And in John, it tells us that who the Son sets free is free indeed, meaning who Jesus sets free, who believes in Jesus, we have freedom from sin. Now, that, sin, that freedom isn't free. Who paid the price for our sin? Jesus did. Jesus did when he died on the cross. And just like in our country, we have men and women who have defended us, who have fought for our freedom here in our country. Jesus paid the penalty, even more than that, paid the penalty for our sin so that we're not a slave to our sin. We can be set free when we trust, with our faith and trust in him. All right, so as we're celebrating our freedoms and we have fireworks and we have flags all over the place and fun decorations and fun things that you're going to do this week and you're recognizing the freedom of our country, Let's also think about the freedom that God gives us um, through his son, Jesus Christ, okay? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the way that you love us. Father, we thank you for the way that you gave us Jesus um, to take care of the sin that we have um, in our life. Father, help us not to look at sin and make it okay or um, in our minds think that um, it's not a big deal because, Father, we know that any sin— is something that separates us from you. Father, let us not live as slaves to sin, walking around struggling with that, Father. Help us to step into the freedom that you give us through your son, Jesus Christ. God, as we celebrate this um, week, we celebrate a, a fun holiday for our country. Let us be thankful for the country that we live in, for the sacrifices that have been made from men and women who have fought, from families who have supported them as well, Father. 
And let us not ever forget the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, for our sin as well. God, we love you. We praise you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we celebrate the 4th of July today, we come to you to show our gratitude for the freedom and the people of this nation. We'd also like to thank you for the brave men and women that put themselves in danger every day for this country to protect us that you sent yourself. Lord, we would also like to thank you for the opportunity to go to Somersault. Thank you for showing us a glimpse of why and how we should be living our lives to glorify you, Lord, and for reminding us that once again, that you sent your son to die for our sins so that we will have eternal life. Now as we come to our time offering, may we give back even a little bit of what you have so graciously blessed us with, Lord. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Skyway, 
I saw below me that golden valley. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island. From the to forest to the ocean waters. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island. From the to forest to the ocean waters. So it's, it's fantastic just being with you this morning as we are just honoring our nation's birthday coming up soon. And thank you that we can be a church that does that. Um, but also another great thing that we're doing today is we're going to recognize what happened at Somersault this past year. Um, so two weeks ago or three weeks ago, however long it's been, uh, our youth did, went to Somersault down in Charleston. It's a youth camp. And it's really where they like to have a lot of fun, um, but they also get very serious with their walk with Christ. And it, I, we, this year was the biggest group that I've taken. And normally we let, you know, a lot of people speak, but we took 27 students or 27 all together. So I can't get 27 people up here. But we'll be here forever. So what I did is I chose three different people um, to start us off as I chose uh, Sayla Berry. Um, she can come on up and with Kim Clark. Uh, Sayla Berry, this was her first year into the youth ministry. This is also her first year at Somersault. Uh, so you're going to get to see a side of what it's like for a first-time uh, camper to be at Somersault. But I also wanted Kim Clark to speak. This is Kim Clark. This is her first time chaperoning for Somersault this year. So you get to see a first-time student versus a first-time adult and see what the two experiences were like for both of them. Good morning, everyone. If you don't know me, I'm Sayla Berry, and I get a chance to go to Somersault at Charleston Southern University with the youth group this year. Somersault is a camp where you learn to get closer to Jesus and you worship him every day. It was pretty incredible. The staff members were incredible and kind. They also taught us so much about the Lord. I feel that because of Somersault, I have a closer relationship with Jesus, and I'm extremely thankful for the opportunity that was given to me. This was my first time at Somersault or any camp, so I'm here to share my personal experience and how God worked in my life that week, because my life was definitely changed. First of all, God gave me the courage to share my testimony in my Bible study class. This class had only one person I knew from our youth group, and that was Anna Kohler. So the rest of the people, I had no clue who they were, even the Bible study members. I, ne I had never shared my testimony, but God tugged on my heart, and I knew he wanted me to. I also don't like talking in front of people I don't know, so this was a big change for me and very different. Secondly, God allowed me to worship differently. Instead of me just singing, I really focused on lyrics. I was focused on lyrics before Somersault, but not as much as I should have to be worshiping him. I think God really wanted this for me because every song the Somersault band sang, the lyrics got to me and I sang them fully worshiping him. I cried a lot because of the lyrics, and now that experience has taught me to focus more on lyrics, not getting tempo or notes right. That is the second step, getting tempo or notes right. The first is me making sure I fully worship him with the songs I sing. This changed my worship to him because I love to sing, so now I know how to fully worship him through every song I sing. Lastly, God led me to good pick classes. 
HIT classes were personal interest classes that you could take to learn more about something such as ministry, songwriting, serving, and more. It was up to you to decide what class you wanted to take. I prayed over all of them, and God led me to the classes with areas to work on in my life. One example being the serving class, where I learned to serve with a good attitude, even with, when the ones who you are serving don't have a good attitude. These classes really changed my life and helped me work on areas of my life and learn more about these areas. Before I close, let me thank Pastor Charles for letting me speak up here today. Also, let me thank Pastor Nathan for driving us to Somersault and for asking me to do this because I love sharing what God has done in my life to inspire all of you to share with others what God has done in your life. I lastly want to thank Miss Joy, Miss Kim, and Mr. Phillip for watching us crazy kids and driving us places outside of campus such as Chick-fil-A, the bowling alley, and to and from Somersault. Thank you for letting me share this morning. So what Nathan really wanted to say was I was the oldest going, so that's what he really wanted to say. But um, this was my first time at Somersault. Um, there's been multiple reasons why I have not been able to go on Somersault in the past few years, just some different circumstances. I wish I could have went, but um, Somersault was an absolute amazing time. Um, I can tell you, I drove down separately and as I got on 95 and was driving down to Charleston Southern University, I had Caleb playing and I'm like, thank you Lord for finally letting me get the opportunity to go to Somersault. Um, as I showed up at Somersault and I'm checking into the dorm, I have flashbacks of going off to college going, how in the world am I gonna make it through a week on a metal mattress? a room full of teenage girls and it smelled nothing like bath, but bath and body all week long. But I had amazing sweet mates. I had amazing girls. These kids loved on each other all week long. Even if they didn't know each other, they loved on each other. They would sit in the hallway. They would talk about what happened at Somersault that day. They would talk about their pigs. Uh, the picks that they were going to, even though they haven't even been there yet, they would talk about those picks that were coming up. Um, I attended many trips as a youth um, when I was at, at church, but this was nothing like I've ever experienced. We were busy all day long. I meant from, but Nathan would get us up early, it's 6 o'clock in the morning until 12.30 at night. We were running off five hours of sleep every night, but that was just... It was a good feeling. It wasn't a busy feeling like the world. You were busy worshiping the Lord all day long. Whether you were sitting outside on campus or you were watching the youth change classes from their picks. That was, that was an amazing time to watch that. Um, the entire staff at Somersault always stayed involved with the kids 100% whether they were in the classes with them or walking around the campus they stayed involved with our youth, whether it was impersonal. They would just take time to gather in the corner with them and talk to them. That's what it means to be at camp. That's what shows these kids that they can worship the Lord at any given time. I miss it. I was telling the youth this morning in Sunday school that I wish I could worship like that every single day that there was no other outside influences, that we could just stand there, we could worship. Because when that song was playing earlier, what you don't know is I had the opportunity to get down front with these kids and worship. That's what I wanted to do, is to stand there and praise and worship and sing and just feel the, feel the Lord upon me. I needed it too. I needed it just as much as the rest of these youth needed it. The rest, even the staffers, the leaders, we have the opportunity to worship all day long and nobody interrupt us. Um, I will say the main focus of Somersault was having these youth learn to give their testimony and watching the Somersault staffers give their testimony and these youth know that all of these kids didn't grow up as church growers. All of these kids didn't grow up um, on fire for the Lord. Some of them were hit later in life. And so they could relate to them on the basis that at any given time, the Holy Spirit could come upon you and you need the Lord. From day one, you need the Lord. 
but I want to thank y'all for letting me go with these these youth because um, I felt convicted also because I, I will tell you when you come back to the to the real world you like I really would rather worship all day long why can't we just do this all day long so myself I was convicted um, of making sure I continue to worship show these kids how to continue to worship um, so thank you for the opportunity to be able to go with these youth I love these youth so thank you Thank you, Kim, and as, hopefully you can realize how great Somersault is for you children in here who are going to Kids Salt. Keep these things in mind because Kids Salt is the exact kind of same thing just for, for kids, so you'd be thinking about that. Um, next, we're going to have Michael Clark come and speak about his experience. Um, what nobody knows other than me and Michael and his parents, even our youth did, don't know this until now. Michael did something different this year. Um, Michael, yes, he's, he was, we all knew that he was going to be in a Bible study by himself, a Bible study group by himself, but there was a reason for it this year. Uh, this year, I put him in a group called Catalyst, and what Catalyst is, is um, Somersault's way of taking who youth ministers recommend, and it's only upon rec youth ministers' recommendation that they take them. Um, but after having a lot of conversation with Michael leading up to Somersault, um, I felt led to put him in this catalyst group and what this catalyst group is is for for students who are wanting to learn more and their leader and build more in their leadership skills um, so it's, it would help him to learn more about leadership but it was also for students who are searching is God's will for me to be a ministry um, so uh, based upon our conversations um, I wanted Michael to experience this one week of Catalyst so he can kind of sort these things out and Michael's going to share his experience. So as Nathan said I was in a different group this year I was in the Catalyst group and um, when Nathan asked me about it for some reason I normally think about stuff but when he asked me I was like yeah just put me in there I want to do it and um, when I was going in I was nervous because you know I was going into this group of people I don't know never met in my life I was going to be in there by myself but when I got in there, I realized I was surrounded by these young men and women who you are searching for answers. They are, have the same struggles I do. They, um, they, they're looking for what God has planned for their life. Um, but I also realized when I got there that I had a peace that that was right where God wanted me to be. I was right where I needed to be. He was, I, by the end of the first night going into the second day, I could feel that he was already working in my life and preparing me for the week. Um, but as day one came to a close and day two started, I really saw God working, not in me, but people around me. Um, I guess this is a group that is considered leaders in their youth group, and so in the class, you can kind of, it also teaches you more about God, but it also teaches you how to be a better leader. And so like every day you would, they would, our leader would break us apart and put us, and we would have to find a letter, like for L, we would have to find a word that would help you become a better leader that started with L and E and A and D and all the way down. So that really helped me because then you see a different perspective of where people how it can help you when you get back home. Um, but when I got, when it really started, when I guess God really started working on me is when we had got through day one, two, and three, and uh, we were on our last full day at camp, and I was still searching for answers and questions and really looking for God to show me the answers to these questions I had. And I had been listening to different people around me talk, and I couldn't seem to find the exact answer I was looking for. I was still trying to find the answer to where God is leading me in life and where his will for my life was. I don't think these answers became entirely clear until I attended one of my personal interest classes, which was led by Steve Roback. He stated that we are all called to ministry, but some of us have a direct call. So now I had the new question, was I one of the all called or one of the direct called? After coming out of my shell a little bit that week and sharing my testimony with um, somebody in my group as well as my leader, Paige, 
I started to have another question. All this whole time we're here this whole week, we're filled with God every day and we worship him all day and it's easy, you know, he's right there, we feel him all day. But when we go back home to our busy schedules, how do we stay focused and search for these answers? And I think it came clear to me, I don't remember who said it, but somebody said, just go home and don't let camp end. So what you do all day here and all week, do it when you get back home. So that's been one thing I've definitely tried to do, and I think a lot of people in the youth group has tried to do, is not let camp end when we're back here. And as I left Friday, I could really see that God was moving in my life and the lives of those around me. We came to camp looking for answers to our questions, and some left with those questions answered, and some, like myself, left with a peace, knowing that they could return home and continue looking for these answers. So if there's one thing that Somersault 2024 taught me, is there are people around me who have struggled with the same things as I do, and if we just allow God to work and not let camp in, then we will have all of our questions answered in God's timing. I have to say, Somersault 2024 was the best one I've been to yet, and I'd like to thank Nathan for giving me the opportunity to be in the Catalyst group because it helped me a lot. Thank you. Now I'm going to pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for giving us the opportunity to go to Somersault and um, just thank you for Nathan and Miss Joy and my mom and dad and all the youth for just allowing us to have an amazing week. I pray, Lord, that um, you will continue to let us all live a life that feels like camp and not lose our focus on you. And um, I pray, I just thank you for this week. I thank you for this day. And I pray that you'll be with Nathan as he brings the message. Just open our hearts and our ears. And we love you. And Jesus, I pray. Amen. Historical figure? I don't know. I think he was just a person. I don't know. Just a normal person like us. He was a selfless person. I have no clue. He was a man. I think he was marketing genius because he got people to believe him. I don't. I don't think he's the son of God. I don't. Don't believe that at all. If David Copperfield was in the day of Jesus, he would be Jesus. I'm pretty sure he existed. Like I'm not gonna say that he didn't exist. He was God's son, but so was Gandhi, and so was Muhammad, and so was you know. We're all God's children. Jesus is someone I pray to. Well, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Um, and he, to me, is the like symbol of just ultimate forgiveness and ultimate love. He's sort of that like constant figure in my life. Jesus is also Isa in Arabic, and he was a messenger as well. He was just extremely enlightened, like religiously and morally. Was somebody that um, just tried to um, impart wisdom on others and um, make the world a better place. I think he saw something that a lot of people didn't see and still don't see in others. And I, I think that's just a lot of love and, and hope. Jesus sort of seemed like an ominous uh, figure. You know, he just, he, he was God and it was hard to relate to him. But I think as I've grown in my faith a lot, I've really started to see Jesus as my closest friend. What's your thoughts? How do you feel watching that? Um, so as we celebrate 4th of July today, um, we just watched a video of someone doing an interview question of who is Jesus in, I think that was the, um, the Central Park in New York City. And um, how do we get from what we were as established country in the very beginning to people not knowing who Jesus truly is. How do we get there? How do we get to where, as Pastor Charles was asking in his prayer at the first, first of the service, you know, apologizing for what America has come. How do we get to that point where America is to where it is today? Um, this July 4th marks 248 years that our country will be, 248 years old. Uh, July 4th, 1776 is when the Declaration of Independence was signed, declaring our independence from Great Britain. Um, and America's origin 
and beliefs at that time were founded and rooted in God's word. Christianity was definitely the dominant belief, and rightfully so. So how is it possible that 248 years, this come Thursday, how is it possible that people are not aware of who God truly is? So what is our story as a nation? What is our story as the United States? Our, star, our story is we are founded, a nation founded upon the one true God, Jesus. Our father, our forefathers were devout Christians. That is who we were. Christian values, beliefs, and terminology were all found all throughout the founding documents and legislation and even in our education systems. We were all a nation that turned to God in prayer, trusted, trusted in his will, and sought his divine leadership. We have been blessed tremendously by God because of those things, and I strongly believe it's because we were a nation who feared God, um, that God allowed America to be such a dominant figure on the world stage as it is today, because he's blessed us, and that's why we are the leader of, for all of the other countries. And this is why we should always remember, especially on the 4th of July, what we're here for. You know, shame on those churches who do not do patriotic services. I thank you, church, for allowing us, to, for doing it with us, that we are taking part in patriotic services, because it's all because of God is the reason why we are the way we are, so especially as a nation. So it's rightfully so that we honor God in, in these patriotic services for what he has done for our country. Um, but we now have gotten away from the Christian godly roots as a country. People are clueless, as you saw in the video, about who the true God is, who Jesus really is. They are clueless about it all. Even Christians aren't recognizing God for who he truly is. Even Christians aren't recognizing Jesus for who he truly is. Even Christians aren't putting him Lord and Savior over the entire life. What you're getting is this half-hearted Christian lifestyle. What you're getting is these half, or what it is, is half-hearted Christianity is only possible when we don't see Jesus for who he truly is. That's how you get this half-hearted Christianity, when we do not see Jesus for who, what, or for who he truly is. So this morning, my job and what I would love to do is I would like to share with you in the next 12 minutes who Jesus really is. So let's look at Luke chapter 9. Starting with verse 18, it says, And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Who do the people say that I am? So this is Jesus looking at his disciples, saying, Who do the people say that I am? And they answered, Some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others the one of the prophets of the old has risen. And then verse 20, he makes it very personal, and he said to them, But who do you say that I am? He turns to Peter and says, but who do you say that, that I am? And Peter answered, you are Christ of God. Would you pray with me? God, again, Lord, we just give apologies for what we have become as a nation. God, we beg your forgiveness. Beg your mercy for it. And God, may you humble your children. May you humble this nation and bring us back to you. Let us turn from our wicked ways. But God, in order to do that, we need to see you for who you truly are. So God, I pray, Lord, now that you just really, through the sound of my voice and through the words that you use, may you just really help us to captivate who you truly are. In Jesus' name, amen. So he looks at Peter and says, but who do you say that I am? And he says, Christ of God. The NIV version says, the God, the Messiah. But Peter further says this about Jesus as well in, in Acts chapter 2 that I wanted to highlight. In Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 22, it says, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Now this is what Peter is just saying again in Acts. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as yourselves know. So he did all of these things. And then verse 23, this man was handed over to you by God, God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. So who is Jesus? He is someone who God, in his plan, was sent to the earth to be nailed to the cross. 24, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. 
because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So yes, Jesus did die on the cross, but then God, and through God's ability, and through who he is as God, he was able to conquer death and rise up from it because death had no hold on who Jesus was. So who is Jesus? Someone who can conquer death. Think about that. Who else is Jesus? In verse 32, he says, God raised Jesus to the life, and we are all witnesses of it. Matter of fact, he goes on and says there was over 500 witnesses of it. Verse 33, exalted to the right hand, he was, has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Jesus is someone who was died on the cross, yes, but he resurrected from the grave and he was brought to life because he is life. And he was exalted to God's right hand. What does that mean? He is God. That is who Jesus is. So what should our response be when we hear who Jesus truly is? Our response, Peter actually says it in verse 38. It says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, all of us, every single person needs to repent and be baptized in the name of the Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. So our response for Jesus coming to this earth, dying on a cross for our sins, rising from the grave, our response should be to repent and to be baptized. And then you will receive the Holy Spirit. Again, who is Peter talking to? What's, who's his message for? He further says it in verse 39. The promise is for you and your children. So it's not just you, it's for future generations too. That's who Peter's saying. It's not just for you, and I'm saying this to you guys, for our church today. It's not just for us, it's for future generations, for everyone. That's who this message is for. It's for all children, all who are far off, for all whom the Lord, have, um, our God, will call. It's for everyone. That is what this message is for. Again, half-hearted Christianity is only possible when we don't exactly see who Jesus is and for what he has done for us. When we just kind of cast it aside, that's when you get this half-hearted Christianity going. So in Luke chapter 9, I want to bring you to the transfiguration. Many of you know where he goes up on the mount, and he reveals himself to Peter and James. So let's read about the transfiguration to see more exactly who Jesus really is. It says, Now about eight days after, after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, pay attention to this, as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. Jesus is now revealing a little bit of who he is. He took back the man part and started revealing a little bit of the God part, and his face was altered. And his clothes became dazzling white. You know, this uh, translation says it became almost like lightning. You get to see the fullness of God in Jesus in this moment, where his face is altered, and he's also, his clothes are being dazzling white. Verse 30, and behold, two men were walking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. They're talking about Jesus going to the cross. That's what they're talking about. And his departure in, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to be raised up, and I'm going to ascend back into heaven. That's what these, uh, Moses and Elijah were speaking with Jesus about. Um, verse 32, now Peter and those who were with them were heavily asleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory in the two men who stood with them, saw Jesus's glory separated from the two men. I want you to see that. So Jesus is completely different. He's not just some man. He's not just some person that came to this earth for no re whatever reason. He is God and, and he is showing his glory in this moment. Verse 33, and as the men were parting with him, Peter said, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. He didn't fully understand this. So he was just acting on emotion. So he's like, let's make three tents or three temples here, three shrines for this per person. And Jesus like, no, you don't understand what you're saying. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. This cloud is God, the Father. Here he comes. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. So who is Jesus? 
Jesus is God's son, the, my chosen one, his chosen one. Then he gives a command, listen to him. So who is Jesus? Jesus is God's son. He's God in, in, in flesh. You're seeing the glory right here in the transfigura transfiguration. He's not just some man. He's not just some mythical cre or, you know, character that you read about in the Bible. No, it is a real thing. God, Jesus is God, and you're going to see his glory. We can see his glory, and we're seeing it here. And then just imagine you're just on this mount with him, and this cloud comes, and you hear this, I can only imagine this thundering-sounding voice says, This is my son, my chosen one. So who is Jesus? That is who Jesus is. So the common theme of Somersault this year was, um, was called Warp, Confronting Culture's Lies with God's Sacred Story. So we're, we're kind of counterculture, but the, really the big theme is for just sharing who Jesus really was. And just really helping our students really zone in on who Jesus is and who he is to them. He's God. He's Savior. And this is not mine. This is uh, Dallas Wilson who gave this, and Pastor Charles and I kind of working together to kind of come up with it as well. But here is the gospel in a nutshell. If you wanted to put the gospel in a nutshell in four different points, here it is. The whole gospel, the very first point, Jesus is God who came to earth for mankind. He stepped out of heaven, as Philippians 2 says, and came to earth. Second, Jesus gives his life for our sin. As you read all throughout the Gospels, Jesus came to the earth to die on the cross, not for his sin, but for our sin. Third, Jesus resurrected from the grave. Three days later, we all know the Easter story. I take that for granted. Some of you might not know that Easter story. Three days later, he rose from the grave. He was dead. He became alive, right? He rose from the grave. Fourth, we make Jesus Lord and Savior of our life. So that's the whole gospel, the whole gospel. You might think the gospel is just Jesus came, he died, he rose, but it's four points to it. Jesus came, he died, he rose for us, and the fourth aspect of the gospel is we must respond to that by making him Lord and Savior of our life. Lord and Savior, not just some God that we recognize. He needs to be Lord and Savior of your life. That means you give him full reign to your life. This past Wednesday, I was talking to our youth about who is on your throne. Are you on your throne or is God on your throne? To put Lord and Savior of your life is you're removing yourself off of your throne, your pedestal, and putting God in his rightfully, rightfully place. For some people, if they died and went to pearly gates and were asked, this is hypothetical, and were asked, why should you be allowed into heaven? Some would probably start listing all of these accolades that they had. Some would say all of these good deeds that they did. But the reality is, is there is nothing that we have or claim that we can do that will make us worthy of entering into heaven. That's reality. There is nothing that we can do, there is nothing that we can have that makes us worthy of entering into heaven. Nothing. By ourselves alone, there's nothing. So all we can say is, if we're ever asked that question is why should you be allowed into heaven? You say, I shouldn't be, but Jesus saved me. That's who we can claim. So who is Jesus? Your Savior. That's who Jesus is. All we can say is Jesus saved me. It is because of Jesus, and that's all I have, but that is enough. And that is our testimony. You heard, you know, these people from Somersault, they were really zoning in on what our testimony is. Our testimony is we are not enough. We are not worthy of heaven. We are not worthy. We are not righteous, but God. And Jesus saves. That is our testimony. Um, and we learned in Sunday school about if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face, I will restore their land. We use that a lot in the July 4 sermons. We use that a lot. So humble yourself. What is my testimony? Here's my testimony in a nutshell. I am an ordained minister. I have been ministering for 15 years now. I have been a Christian for 34 years now. No, I haven't committed any crimes. I do not do any drugs. I have never done drugs. 
I don't drink, I never have. I don't smoke, never have. I don't vape, never have. You won't even find cussing a part of my vocabulary. It's not in there. But I am a sinner. That's my testimony. Yeah, I have all of those things. whoop de doo I am still a sinner. I stand before you now in this pulpit as a sinner. I want all of you to know that. Just because we're ministers does not exempt us from sin. We still sin. I am a sinner. That is my testimony. I am a sinner. Every single day, I need a Savior. Every single day, I need God's grace. Every day, I need Jesus. To the point to... I can actually start to tell when my quiet times have been rushed. I can start to tell when things are slacking on my relationship and my walk with Christ. I can really feel that. That is my testimony because without Christ, I suffer. Because Nathan gets in the way, the sinner gets in the way, and things get all messed up. So every day, I have to have this relationship with Jesus because it is through him that I can experience life to the fullest it is through him that i can find peace it is through him that i can find love outside of him i'm dead outside of him i'm unrighteous it is because of who jesus is and what he has done for me that my story gives him glory or should give him glory let's all be able to say that Our story should bring him glory. So I ask you, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Not just a superficial one, because Judas had that. A real, genuine relationship with Jesus. Each and every day, you're having a conversation with him. You're in his word. You're praising his name. Every single day, you're feeling his presence and you're feeling his love. Do you have that? Jesus is who we need. Jesus is who our families need. Jesus is who our country needs. Going back to Luke chapter 9, verse 20, it says, Who, did, who do you say I am? Well, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Does your faith affect your life? That's a great question. Does your faith affect the way that you live? Because it should. Jesus should affect the way that you live. 80% of Christians say that their faith does not affect the way that they're, they're live, their life or their lifestyle. That's sad. And that explains a lot about our country. We need to repent. We need to fall on our faces, humble ourselves, seek his face if we want our land restored. So, I ask you, in closing, who do you say Jesus is? Maybe you've never experienced Jesus. Maybe you've never asked him as Lord and Savior of your life. I'd be glad to pray with you down front and show you how to do that. Maybe you are a Christian. Maybe you've been living a half-hearted life, a half-hearted Christianity. Come to this altar and just repent. Seek his face. That's your invitation this morning. Would you come? Let us pray. God, I thank you, Lord, for just who you are, God. God, I thank you, Lord, that you showed your glory on the transfiguration, a little, a little insight to who you truly are that we can read about. God, we thank you that you are God. But God, I pray, Lord, for those who may not see you as that. I pray, Lord, for those who may not fully understand who you truly are as, as God, as Jesus. God, may they come to you now. May you pull at their hearts. In Jesus' name.